Testing. Howdy. How are you all doing? I am David Maynard, and we are here to talk about bringing sexy back. However, if you're expected to see Justin Timberlake, I am sorely disappointing you. You'll just have to see me topless, which I think will be just as good. So if you don't know me, my name's David Maynard, and I'm with a small company out of Atlanta called Errata Security, and this gentleman to my right is uh, Robert Graham. He's the CEO, and Rob's famous for a lot of things, like inventing IPS. That's pretty much about it. Um, but what we're, what we're going to be talking about today is we, uh, we as a company do a lot of pen testing, and we don't do traditional pen testing because that's kind of boring. You know, everybody runs their vulnerability scanners. Uh, that gets kind of old and repetitive, and there's actually no real return on investment in there. So we, we actually always seem to end up with clients that want weird custom things done, and we're going to talk about two of the custom things we've done. But before, I have a question. Has anybody had sex with a hooker today? Has anybody been rejected by a hooker today? <laughs> you know, we got more hands for that one. That, that's that's kind of good. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Rob, and I'm going to heckle him. Uh, if you can help me heckle Rob, that would be great. So what this talk is about is uh, getting creative with pen tests. First of all, I want to mention the fact that pen tests in general are supposed to be boring. So Dave and I used to work for Internet Security Systems before they were bought out by IBM, and ISS did a lot of pen tests. ISS was That's a nasty rumor, by the way. There's, there's no actual proof we ever worked for Internet Security Systems. So ISS would also have the X-Force group, which is well known for finding zero-day vulnerabilities. So everyone assumed that uh, ISS would use their O-days on pen tests. But the reality is that ISS never did. Because the point of a pen test is not to see if I can pop you with O-Day, which in most cases everyone sort of accepts that that's true. The point of a pen test is to say, are my defenses adequate for the likely sort of attacks I'm likely to get? So for most, most corporations, their likely attacks are from script kiddies or from this well-honed industry of, of phishing and script kiddies and uh, crawlers coming against their, their sites. So the tests that, that most pen testers do are very simple. There you port scan it, you run a vuln scanner against it, you do some password cracking, you, you try some cross-site scripting attacks with automated tools, you run your automated tools looking for SQL injection. And that's the, the height of the uh, threats that most corporations are going to be affected with. Now one of, the, one of the interesting things we've noticed is that any time you do a pen test, you know, you know the first time you want to figure out anything. You just put it in the Google, right? Google sh Googling your client should be part of a pen test, but I have yet to see any reports that actually include it. Just doing like, you know, a, a, uh, finding out all, everything that Google has indexed from uh, your client is uh, a lot easier than, you know, trying to find everything manually. And, you know, as, as you've seen from Johnny Lon's talks and things like that, you can actually find a lot of interesting things just from Google. So that's the kind of stuff we're going to be talking about, weird and interesting things. So the next question is, is when creativity is good? And that is for the small subset of customers that realize that they're not just under attack from your standard script kiddies, but they've actually got serious people that are motivated to get them. And really they fall into two primary uh, categories. One is financial, fir uh, financial firms, Wall Street firms. They've got a lot of money, hackers are, are trying to get it. The other is government agencies. Uh, everyone in, in the world outside the United States and actually inside the United States too, when they go to bed at night dreaming about who am I going to attack tomorrow, they're dreaming about the Department of Defense. I dream about Cindy Margolis. So uh, that's when creativity is good is the more uh, fearful organizations that have got reason to fear that they fear a well-funded, determined adversary. So one thing we've looked at for a lot of our customers over the years of if, if you want to have a guaranteed return on investment, imagine that you're a venture capitalist firm, but you're not funding venture capital uh, startups in Silicon Valley. You're funding Russian crime bosses to go after American financial firm to hack. So how much would it cost for a Russian crime boss to hack an, uh, an American corporation? We estimate that it would probably be about a million dollars. Uh, they would hire a few hackers. They would spend a year scanning the site, um, reverse engineering their applications, and doing lots of strange things. And over that year, they would gradually work their way into the network and then 
find things like, okay, if we grab a million dollars or a hundred million dollars from this company, how do we like avoid uh, tripping financial controls? A good example of this is a French firm recently, in the last six months, is a one of their traders um, was previously involved in setting up their financial controls to detect if massive amounts of money are being transferred illegally. Since he worked on that system, when he became a financial trader himself, he uh, nearly bankrupted the company, losing billions of dollars trading things uh, that he wasn't supposed to. Now, he wasn't trying to steal the money. As it turns out, he had just made some bad trades and then kept doing more trades to try to recover and get back to his original position. We are all here in Vegas, so we know how that is. We lose 10 bucks. Well, if I keep playing, maybe I'll win that $10 back. And I go 20 down, 100 down, 1,000 down, 10,000 down, and now I have to walk home instead of driving. So, so this guy had ba bypassed the internal controls. So that's the sort of thing you need to start thinking about from creative attacks, is uh, if I'm a well-funded adversary and I'm trying to emulate a well-funded adversary against a, a corporation, I need to start thinking creatively. As a disclaimer for this slide, it all, we're not singling out Russian crime lords. It also works with Brazilian crime lords, Japanese crime lords, Indonesian crime lords, if there is such a thing. So one of our ideas that we came up with that we've used is iPhone in the box. And that was sort of the uh, impetus for the uh, title for the talk is, uh, um, what's the title of the talk? Getting Sexy Back? Yeah, getting Sexy Back. And unfortunately, Dave Maynard here is the uh, Justin Timberlake fan. And so I'm not really up on Justin Timberlake as, as Dave is. But uh, they did, uh, Justin Timberlake did a sketch for Saturday Night Live, I don't know, last year in Christmas or two years ago which was, uh, sounds like iPhone in a box. So the idea is simple. You get a box, you put your iPhone in the box, and you mail the box. In case you were wondering, this idea literally came from a drunken night while watching that Justin Timberlake video. <laughs> so step one, you have to get a box. We use the original iPhone box because if you're shipping an iPhone in an iPhone box, that doesn't really look all that suspicious. So uh, it's the perfect size for everything because, you know, under the little plastic tray that the iPhone comes in, there's all this space. And you know what would fit perfectly in that space is a battery. So this is all the material we used. That's the iPhone box. That's the um, iPhone itself. And that is the APC battery. And we have one actually right here on stage. Unfortunately, due to a mishap, we don't have ours, but we were able to borrow Rich Mobile's. So we're going to have to do something bad to it before we give it back to him. So uh, Dave did a lot of work to get his iPhone, actually my iPhone, packaged up. Uh, and before we took the flight here, we FedExed it to the hotel here. It arrived fine. It was carried up to his, to his, to his room. We uh, then showed it to a bunch of reporters. And then this morning, Dave wants to bring R the box here. Horse. He wants to bring the box here for the presentation, which was the whole point. Uh, and he leaves it in the cab. So somewhere, somebody's enjoying a, you know, I should get the pony for epic fail. I know, I know, I know. And the so, sad part about that is it's my iPhone, not his. This is his iPhone. <laughs> so let, let's talk about some interesting things. That APC battery that we're talking about, on a standard, uh, not to 3G, because the 3G sucks battery life like crazy. But on a standard iPhone, we found out with it fully charged, with the battery fully charged, you put it in a box and send it somewhere, it can stay on for about five days which means that, you know, you have about five days to scan uh, and do basically uh, whatever you want from the iPhone, which is enough to FedEx it overnight somewhere, let it sit in somebody's receiving facility, let them figure out that there's no one there named Jack me off, and then have them send it back. So, so far, we've always returned, gotten the iPhone back, and it's still running. An iPhone? Yeah, that I was just lost in the cab, so, and it's in the, it's in the original, UP, was it UPS or FedEx? So actually what we're worried about now is somebody's going to look at that and see there's an iPhone with a battery and think it's a bomb. So if, if you guys see a bomb scare tonight, don't tell anyone it was us. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just keep it between us. And one of the f things we haven't done yet, I, I, and I'm kind of disappointed Dave lost the box, because I wanted to see what it looks like through an x-ray machine. So I, my first thought was, okay, I'm going to carry it through the x-ray machine and take a picture of the x-ray as it goes through to see if it looks like a bomb. Then I thought the better of it in thinking that Dave should do that. 
So as a little back history, last year uh, we were at a, a conference and Rob was reading a paper in Seattle and he said that you have to get tased now in the state of Se uh, Washington to buy a taser. He goes, you know what we should do? We should have a poll on our website to see which one of us gets tased, knowing full well I was going to lose. So I ended up getting tased. So basically when it comes to RADA and things where you can almost get arrested or more, more likely, I seem to end up getting the short end of the stick. So, by the way, just as, a, as an offside, is that this APC battery pack, it's, I've never really heard much news about it, but it's very light, and it really lasts actually a fairly long time. So we're, uh, we're being sponsored by APC. No, we're not. So, um, so this is actually really cool. If you're thinking about using mobile devices to hack with, this is actually a fairly useful device to have with you. It's great because it charges via USB, and, you know, the other end of the, the uh, iPhone is just USB, so you plug it in, you're ready to go. Right. No, no soldering, no hacking required. This could be almost grip kitty hardware hacking. So it's just got USB in and USB out, and it, it's, it rocks. So here's a, since we don't have the box to show you, here's the original picture of the box. And as you can see, it's got a nice little slot to hold up the iPhone. And underneath it, it's got a great place to put the iPhone. It needs a little bit of uh, cardboard hacking to actually cut a hole in it so that you can fit in the, uh, get the, all the cables in. So here's pictures of Dave taking his box and cardboard hacking. And here's, you can see the little... We actually had to end it. up cutting a slit right there so the battery and, you know, the cables and everything would fit. But when you put the top of the box back on, it looks just like a regular box. And that's it running. Uh, so one of the things you have to do uh, is when the phone goes into auto lock mode, like a lot of the interactive stuff you have running on it will, will stop running. So we recommend that you turn off auto lock and make sure it doesn't like automatically power off. And fortunately, the iPhone is shipped to you as a mobile device. So Apple's very concerned about powering off as often as it can to avoid sucking down all the battery. But we want to use it as a, a Linux machine or a free BSD machine. And so we have to actually turn off all these wonderful, nice user features that Apple has just to make like the Linux, the free BSD stuff work. So this is the gayest picture of me ever taken. This uh, is, this if is you actually look at pose. some ads for some gay bars here in Las Vegas, you'll find that this is not the gayest picture of David ever taken. This, uh, this was my audition photo for Thunder Down Under. <laughs> so after you do this, and if, if you work for Apple or their law firm, please cover your ears. The first thing you have to do is jailbreak the iPhone. And, you know, I assume everybody here has a jailbroken iPhone. So, you know, uh, after that you saw the uh, SSH and BSD subsystems. And, you know, I've gotten a lot of flack like this week already from Mac Zealots. They're like, oh, my God, why are you doing this with an iPhone? You can do this with any phone. Well, it's actually really hard to do with a Windows Mobile phone because Windows Mobile doesn't have a Unix-like interface right <laughs> underneath it. So you could, you could, I, I suppose you could do it with Symbian, but if you've ever tried to use that SDK, it'd be better just to do it with the iPhone. So I, for disclaimer purposes, you can pretty much do this with any device that has both a uh, network connection to something like AT&T and a Wi-Fi connection. It's just a lot easier with the iPhone. Right, I mean, uh, Dave's notebook, like this notebook right here, has an HSDPA connection built into it. So in theory, we could do the same thing with this notebook and ship it to a customer. Because I don't trust the Wi-Fi network here, and I hope you don't either. But it's a lot heavier. It costs a lot more to ship, and it's uh, not quite as sexy. So there's a bunch of stuff you have to do. For example, we use the AP logger to keep the Wi-Fi interface going. Otherwise, the, Mac, the uh, Apple uh, software wants to turn it off. So we want to have TCP dump running, like capturing all the packets, all the Wi-Fi raw packets. We also have to do a little bit more custom stuff. One of the problems we have is the SSH daemon, is you can't actually SSH to an iPhone across the Internet because AT&T's network has firewalls that block all incoming connections. We also have the problem of not knowing exactly what the IP address of the iPhone is. So, and there's also issues, it's not always actually on. When it's flying in the airplane, going from FedEx facility to, to like the hotel or something, the internet connectivity is not on. Now, we like to point out that our device is not on while a plane is flying because that would be illegal according to the FAA. So we have an application that, detect, that uses the accelerometer to detect when it's going faster. <laughs> Just for uh, FAA purposes. So, so we just have we just set up a cron job, and we just uh, have a cron to a little reflecting app we've got, 
uh, that simply takes an incoming TCP connection and reflects it on back. So that we have, uh, we SSH into the reflector. You can use Netcat probably for this. We do, actually. Uh, I assumed you wrote something, okay. So you SSH into the reflector. You, you can tell when someone gets into management. They're like, you know, I just assume we do this, and I just assume we do that. <laughs> <laughs> so you SSH into it, and you basically wait an hour for the connection to get to come back in, and then you've got your nice little SSH prompt that you start running your utilities from. Now, there's two things that we like to do, and that's Ferret and Metasploit. Ferret's the Metasploit's tool, awesome. Ferret is the tool that I wrote last year, and I've given, it, I've given presentations at it, Black Hat and stuff. It's, um, it pulls down all sorts of information that notebooks are leaking. So if you sniff right now on the Wi-Fi coming here, uh, you'll find out lots of information about people they're broadcasting about themselves, such as their names. So there's lots of people here that think that they're hackers evading the FBI or something. They're coming incognito. But then their Apple MacBook is saying, it's broadcasting out saying that this is John Smith's computer. So the FBI just listens on the Wi-Fi and they know everyone who's here. And the last access point they connected to was John's secret lair. So, uh, so in our ferret tool, we found out that all sorts of corporate machines are leaking the same information. So uh, that's a great tool to run on the iPhone because you're sniffing the raw packets from the Wi-Fi packet. So imagine a corporation that have done the right thing for pen testing and they have no access points that we can access. We can still listen in on these, on these notebook broadcasts and find out a lot about the corporation. One of the biggest things we found is that they go through, most computers go through a list of all the previous access points that they've gone to. So you can map out, for example, you know, where the sales guys have gone if the CEO has gone to like Microsoft and logged on to their Microsoft uh, internal corporate network uh, access points, then you know if they've been to Microsoft and why the CEO going to Microsoft, maybe they're getting bought out. Or if the CEO has gone to DEF CON. So that's one tool that we find that is great for uh, doing a site survey and finding out a lot about an internal corporation even before we start thinking about hacking access points. Of course, now the main thing we want to send uh, the the iPhone 4 is to find out, does the company have open access points? And if they do, we're going to log on to them, and then we're going to start hacking with, with other tools. One tool, for example, that we like a lot is Metasploit. Metasploit's awesome. One of the cool things, yeah, Dave's lot, added lots of codes like Wi-Fi fuzzing to, to Metasploit. Uh, one of the cool things we found, we, we tried to uh, do this with the latest two, 3G iPhone, but... Uh, it, you know, the, it sucks battery, so it actually is, doesn't work as well. Yeah, so it'll go from running from five days to about a day and a half, which means by the time FedEx delivers it, it's bad. So as a side note, one of the interesting things we've noticed about this, and we've tried this with DHL, with UPS, and with FedEx, internally to all these companies, they seem to have a lot of access points that are not locked down. So as your, uh, as your package is traversing this you know, carrier company, you could do really bad things to a carrier company. Yeah, it's sort of the inner, inadvertent pen testing. Yes, but we wouldn't actually do that because that would be unethical. Uh, but, but one thing we found is that... Um, we shy away from unethical. When you grab the, uh, the latest iPhone stuff, the latest jailbreak stuff, and all the little tools and stuff, uh, you can actually download a Metasploit package for it. I know, did you try it and see if it ran? Yeah, no, it runs. You get the little mood banner, the, the, the cow. That's my favorite Metasploit startup banner. Now let's hear what your favorite Metasploit startup banner is. No? No one? All right, well. So, once again, we're back to gay pictures of me. Yeah. So, actually, wait. Go, go, uh, <laughs> so, strangely, if you're ever in Atlanta, that's a really good uh, uh, Thai restaurant, Nam. Uh, so, as you can see, this, this picture, the, uh, the picture on the side is the, the, the finished version. And as you can tell, you know, if you were uh, looking at it, it doesn't look any different than you had just bought an iPhone. In fact, we told everybody at all the stores where we were uh, FedExing them, or, uh, so you can't FedEx from a UPS store, but we told everybody we were shipping them from that uh, somebody had won an eBay auction and we were sending them an iPhone. You know, we didn't need to tell them that. It just felt like, you know, people were staring at you, you, you feel weird, and you want to tell them why you're doing this. And we're hacking your network didn't seem like a good idea. <laughs> so I don't know if you've noticed this. I've actually lost a lot of weight. That's back when I weighed 250 pounds, and now I'm down to 205, so. That tells you how long we've been doing this. Although I'm wearing almost the exact same outfit. I wash my clothes, I swear. 
So another thing we've been working with is... Uh, wait, 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 there's some more, some more stuff. So the, 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 the thing that we found out about this is when it gets to a receiving facility somewhere, it will just sit there for a while, especially... So people will accept... I don't know if you've ever looked, like worked in a mailroom or seen how a mailroom works or uh, anything like that, but when, generally, like, when UPS, FedEx, or DHL comes to a company, you'll get a whole lot of packages. You'll sign for them all, and then somebody will sit and sort through them all. And then it'll be like, hey, there's nobody here named Jack Mia. I We got to send this back, it, you know, return to sender. There's, there's no one that's ever worked here. While that package is sitting there in their mailroom, generally, which has an access point, for nothing, generally for nothing more than the symbol technology, like readers so, uh, for inventory control systems and things like that, you can then connect to the iPhone and use a Wi-Fi interface to start scanning for uh, different types of packets. Uh, you can associate to the access point. Uh, or you can just basically start uh, collecting data you can use to crack passwords, you know, with tools like Knable and things like that. So th that's basically the gist uh, of the entire thing that we were doing here, is this is a way to get past all the firewalls and crap that people were buying, because, in, I mean, who, who here has ever implemented a DLP system? Right? So something like this would completely bypass your DLP system and allow us to grab credit cards while it's sitting in your mailroom. If there's a point of cell terminal close to your, uh, you know, mailroom. So the the other thing that this really comes in handy with, and I don't know if anyone here's ever done it, but if you ever talk to a SCADA guy, or somebody who runs like SCADA systems, they get very uppity about security. Like we have guys with guns. No one can get near our wireless access points. We'll have them shot. It's like does a FedEx guy come in? Oh yeah, he comes in every day at 10 a.m. <laughs> well, that's that then. I was talking to a reporter about. Um, Media horse. One of the benefits of this is that you don't have to sit outside in your car and be typing on your laptop, which is very suspicious. And the reporter said, yeah, that he actually has been detained by the police before because when he writes stories, he often sits outside in a car typing on a laptop in a place where the police come by and say, why is that guy doing that? It's suspicious. Let's, you know, detain him. So doing this means that you don't have to get arrested for being physically close to your target. Another thing is, is from a pen testing point of view, it's much cheaper Pen testers, as part of a pen test engagement, they'll negotiate with us and say, hey, we want you to come by you know, our five different uh, sites in the United States and, and do a, a, a site audit, a pen test. I want me a wireless uh, pen test. Well, it costs us a day of travel time there and back that we have to bill the customer, plus you know, a couple hours on site, which kind of sucks. So doing this... Especially when you're going to a place like Wisconsin. So I, I don't mean to offend anybody if anybody here is from Wisconsin. <laughs> You see what I mean? <laughs> so, uh, and so, of course, when we do that, th that's the sort of boring part of the pen test. So that's uh, that's the job I, I delegate to David. And so I'm he, a bitch. He doesn't want to do that, so he figures out a reason why he doesn't have to go. So, uh, another, but thinking about it from a point of view of hacking, you know, if the site gets this and they figure out, hey, this is actually probably something hostile, maybe the X-ray ray it and think it looks like a bomb or. They, they, they pull it open and say, why do we have a running iPhone? So one of the questions we have is anonymity. How, you know, maybe they want to track back who sent them this, this hostile device. And, well, since you've already jailbroken the iPhone, it means you can put in pretty much any SIM you want, which means you can go to Czechoslovakia, get a prepaid uh, phone there, pull out the SIM, stick it in your iPhone, and it'll be perfectly anonymous so that you sent an iPhone to a site and it's, there's no clear backtracking back to the person who sent it. Unless, of course, you get a picture taken at the FedEx or Kinko's location you sent it to. In which case, you should smile. So the software for this is going to be released open source. We're trying to set up a repository right now where you can just hit one button and, you know, have your iPhone on a go. But if you check our website next week, the software should be up. It would be up right now if we had the iPhone, but some cabbie right now, I'm sure, has the power to take down the CIA. <laughs> you know what's funny is I was thinking about that. We should actually just have a listener and wait for it. Unfortunately, our listener is back at home when we're here at, uh, at, at DEF CON. Like I said, epic fail. Epic fail. We also think, unfortunately, we didn't have uh, the email client set up, so we can't email, like, naked pictures, you know, promising... The, the cabbie thing if he brings the phone back to us. We do have a young new bio intern that we were offering up in exchange for the iPhone. <laughs> so
So, you know, the, uh, the, the original iPhone doesn't have a very good GPS. It's got that cell tower locational crappy stuff where you can find you within 400 meters. If you walk out on the street and look around 400 meters, how many cabs are there? Yeah, hey, you in the cab, stop. So the second thing we did is we, we came across a client that was like, hey, you know, we've had people do these penetration tests before. We never get anything out of it. And we, we've done some studies. 80% of the malware that we get in our network comes from secretaries. And I'm not being derogatory. Secretaries clicking on things. So they, they wanted to see how you could test phishing without actually, you know, being phished. So basically what we did was set up a VMware image, you know, Linux, um, you know, basically a LAMP setup with a, with a fake website on it. And do you know how easy it is to get certificates to make your fake website look authentic? Rob, how easy is it? So that's a couple slides from here. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of ourselves. So one thing is, is that, um, I saw, well, I was talking to a reporter, and he was saying, you know, like with, with this Dan Kaminsky thing, that one of the things, one of the things. Can we get a hand for Dan Kaminsky in the DNS thing? That was pretty awesome, wasn't it? So, uh, wait, did, did anybody use that to do anything bad or malicious? For good things. So, so Dan stuff, uh, the report was saying how, and one of the things that Dan mentioned is that this yet again shows some of the weaknesses with SSL. Because, of course, when you're spoofing these websites, you're sending things back through, uh, um, to the wrong website, and SSL really doesn't really help you all that much. And that was one of the points he made about our talk, too, is that it, uh, this yet again shows some of the weaknesses of SSL. It doesn't quite work as well as we thought. Uh, the way that SSL works is, is that a root certificate authority like VeriSign uh, verifies that you are who you say you are. So we've got certificates for Rata Security, and so VeriSign verified that we are actually Rata Security. Um, and the way they do that is they go and do a, a Dun & Bradstreet report. When you are uh, a company, uh, Dun & Bradstreet verifies that you're actually a legitimate company. And you have to pay them some money to prove that you're actually verified, that you're actually a company. So it's kind of like Equifax, but for companies. And it's really kind of simple. Is if you can afford the $395, you're probably legitimate and not living out of your, your grandmother's basement. Like Chris Klaus. So you, you create so to create a legitimate company, it's usually like going down twenty nine dollars to uh, to local county's office and say that you're now got a company. You spend uh, a little bit of money. Usually you, you even do it for free. You get a domain name. You go down in brass. You give them four hundred bucks, and then you get your SSL certificate from uh, Verisign or somebody for seven hundred dollars. We're also sponsored by Verisign, or another uh, like Thought or something. So now that you're a legitimate company, so that when people go to our security to our SSL, that will have a nice little padlock icon that says this connection is now trusted, and people will tend to trust that. And our active S control is signed. Um, and so you apply that to, to, to spear phishing. Spear phishing is the idea of you, you target somebody, so like an internal corporation. So instead of broadcasting out to everyone in the world, you get a mailing list of, let's say, every public uh, mailing email address for, let's, for a corporation. Or you could send an iPhone to their uh, shipping department and then enumerate all, all, <laughs> all, the, uh, all the usernames on the Windows domain. So that's, that's spear phishing. But when you do a phishing attack, you often send it back to a website that is, is fundamentally untrustworthy. And the SSL will tell you that this site you can't trust. Do you want to continue? Now, phishing works because most or enough people will continue that you get to break in. And this is a true story. How many here has ever heard a story like this where some guy is very indignant and they're like, I would never download malware. I'm like, really? With your secretary? And then they go, oh. I mean, that, that happens to us generally on a daily basis. Now, having been an executive at a security company, we quickly realize that the secretaries are not security knowledgeable. You think that for an average security company, imagine a five-man consulting company, they've got a secretary, and she still does not know anything about security. So SSL gives you a warning, but people ignore the warning. But imagine that you train people to, to pay attention to that warning. If you go through this process, you'll get no warning, and people will trust you. So uh, one question about this, I, I put a larger number here for creating a real company, is that it comes back to you. So you'll get caught if you're actually doing this maliciously. 
That's why you date a lawyer and have her do it. Uh, or Dave, him, depending on who you are. Dave dates a lawyer. I won't divulge what, whether it's a him or a her. So, so, but one thing you do for a company, though, is you can anonymize it. You hire a lawyer who will then act as the officer of the corporation, your one-man corporation, and you'll have a nice full board of directors of other lawyers in the law firm, and they now are the public face of your company, and people can't really easily penetrate that. Now, law enforcement he can. said penetrate. Law enforcement can give a, a, a warrant, but actually for the average private investigator or normal investigators, they can't penetrate the corporation and find out who you are within your one-man corporation. So a lot of people actually do this. For example, I own a home, but my home is not owned by Robert Graham. It's owned by my corporation, a, a corporation that is, exists solely just to own the home. And I do that for privacy reasons, so people can't look up in the county's assessor's office, look at my social security number. What they find instead is the tax ID of the corporation. Doesn't due diligence just sound dirty? So, um, so you might want to anonymize the company so people can't find out who actually you are. So between one and two thousand dollars, you enter the system of trust, the circle of trust. We've all seen that movie, uh, Meet the Parents, where the XCI agent is like, you know, grilling his new son-in-law or soon-to-be son-in-law, and talking about the circle of trust. A delightful rompant comedy starring Robert De Niro and Ben Stiller. So, for for about being sponsored by Warner Brothers as well. For $2,000, you now enter the circle of trust. You now become the man, and all the other the men trust you as the man. And now you're on the inside, and now all your SSL is good, all your ActiveX is good. So basically, you know the secret handshake, and you have a key to the executive washroom. Now, there is, are some ways to do it cheaper. If you don't want to spend $700 for an ActiveX control signing uh, key, you can actually steal someone else's ActiveX control. Um, there have been a number of ActiveX controls in the last couple years that you can actually serve them from your own website. You can serve a Flash ActiveX, you can serve other stuff from your website that people will then run on their computers. And it's vulnerable, it's signed by a well-known corporation, but it's vulnerable and you can hack into it. A lot of uh, ActiveX controls we've audited, we actually make a, a tool and we make it available for free called Axpan that actually will kill bit bad ActiveX controls we know about. And a lot of the uh, bad ActiveX controls we've tested don't check to see where it's substantiated from. So you could literally host it on your own site. A good example is a recent one, about three months ago, I think, uh, the HP Info Center ActiveX control, and it was part of HP Laptop. So if you have an HP Laptop, you have this ActiveX control. And Don't worry, Dell, Toshiba, and Sony all have similar issues. Yeah. Luckily, uh, Apple doesn't, though. Apple doesn't have security issues. So <laughs> I've been told that by lawyers. So. It exported a couple of good things, like you can write arbit arbitrary register values, and that, that's enough to break in, registry values. But also this launch app uh, method that we export, so with a little JavaScript programming, you say launch app, and you can launch any arbitrary app you want, like you know, CMD download some hostile code via FTP, and then CMD run that hostile code. And now you own the box with a botnet. And it's signed by Hewlett Packard Corporation, which everyone trusts. Hewlett Packard is good. So now imagine a more advanced phishing, uh, spear phishing attack. Is you, first of all, you get an email address list, which you can Google. You get a, l a large list. You can also do other stuff, and then you've got your, at your, your email addresses. Then you spoof an email address from HR at whatever corp that you're hacking. And then you have a message saying, you know, we've now changed 401k providers. Uh, now you need to go to this new website and log in with your corporate credentials. And you'd better do it before the next paycheck cycle, otherwise you won't get your deduction done correctly. And you won't get your match in 401k uh, money. Also, be very careful to follow IT security guidelines. We, we remind you again that you should check the padlock to make sure that you've got a secure SSL connection and that no one's been spoofing your man in the middle of you. And then if you're the man, though, you have a trusted SSL connection, you have a nice little padlock. And they'll come to your website, and you, it looks like a nice corporate IT website, um, or a nice outsourced, touch. outsourced IT website, and a, then they log on with their corporate credentials. A nice touch is on your fake website you set up under the news section. Write an article about how uh, whatever corporation you're targeting has just partnered with this company to provide their 401k services. That always looks legitimate. Now, now I've worked with companies now for a long time that send out these emails that look just like this. 
I used to get them at ISS. We used to get them at ISS. ISS changed their 401k provider, and they told us to go out and log on to this website, basically the email that I have right here. How many people have received emails like this saying, go to an outsourced provider for HR stuff and log on with your credentials? Well, there's more people than had sex with a prostitute in Vegas this time. So that's a, that's a, that's a fair number of people here that their own corporations have essentially fished them. Now, it was a legitimate thing to do. I mean, they're sent out saying, we, we could go to this website and give your credentials. But that's indistinguishable from phishing. And so the, the second thing we then add, once we've got their, their corporate credentials, is add the ActiveX control to it. And saying, OK, now, to actually change your 401k, you need to add, you need to run this ActiveX control. So what's funny is you know, the ActiveX control is presented as a security feature to enhance the security. So what we'll actually find out is people will say yes and install the ActiveX control. Then they'll get to the part where they have to put in their credentials. Then they're like, ha ha, fuck off, Fisher. And you know, you're like, it doesn't really matter. You've installed the ActiveX control at that point. You're owned. So we'll just take your credentials. It doesn't matter. So the upshot is, is that, um, that phishing attacks are actually pretty darn lame. I mean, I, I follow phishing attacks. So I don't have an account at B of A. So I'll gladly click on a, a link to B of A website to enter in some credentials because I know it's not B of A, but I know they're not my credentials. That's and actually how I end up with most of my identity fraud is Rob puts in my credentials. <laughs> So, you, know, you wake up in the morning, find out someone spent $2,800 in Guatemala. You're like, what the hell? I've never been to Guatemala. And what's Pollo? So, uh, but when I, when I go to those sites, I can tell that they're not secure. I mean, they're going through a botnet that's got, you know, spamming all this IP addresses everywhere, that the, the SSL does not work. And it, it, they, they're pretty well done. Visually, they look like B of A or whatever, and they look very good. But, Server side includes are your friend for this kind of stuff. But, you know? but when it says Bank of America dot foo dot, uh, dot TK or something, you know it's dot not Defcon really. Dot org. You, you know it's not actually Bank of America. But with this, we were going to like you know in our in our example, we told them go to Eraticorp because Eraticorp is now we're outsourcing our 401k to it. So they see Eraticorp dot com, and according to SSL, it's actually the certificate. It's actually the name of the email. You know, it all looks legitimate. The most important part of this entire process, aside from the, the press release, is you have to come up with a catchy slogan for the, fa the fake company, like Arata Corp. We're watching your money, and then you can laugh every time you own somebody, because you really are watching their money. But it's also one of those things of if you go to these these, these uh, outsourced HR human resources websites, they always have a bunch of you know very well looking, good looking people in suits shaking hands with each other. No, nobody from this room. Other just stock file photography. Yeah, so it's stock photography. And it's amazing how when you see two people wearing suits, it's kind of like the SSL analogy, is when you see people wearing suits, you automatically trust them. If you see people wearing Che Guevara t-shirts, you tend not to want to give them your money. So and that's, that's the, the logical equivalent of what we're doing here is for a certain amount of money, you now have the, the cyber equivalent of a suit. So, and people trust you. So, so the continue Rod's point, you can actually Google stock photography. You can buy all that stuff to make your site look legitimate for like a buck. Maybe two. So that's the phishing and, the, and the, uh, the iPhone in the box. We've also done some other stuff. It's actually pretty boring, but we find it interesting. Uh, one financial firm used an ActiveX control to, to provide security to their site. So we reverse engineered the ActiveX control and we found out that they had secrets in embedded that they assumed no one would be able to reverse engineer that we were then able to use to help get into their site. Reverse engineer? Who does that? Only illegal hacker kind of people. Uh, there was another customer. They had a software application that would um, update itself via FTP. And we just put a sniffer on the wire to watch the software application. And it would just FTP to, a, to an FTP site. It would give a secret password that only they knew in clear text, of course, and it would then look for a, a, a newer version of the software just by the date on doing the FTP date on the, the directory listing. True, true story. That, that's a security application. And, and it was a security application, by the way. And so, and so we logged, so getting the password from sniffing, we then logged on to the FTP server and found that that directory was read writable. Anybody want to own a security company? Now, now you can, 
Now, you guys have all laughed because you've immediately made the connection. Okay, I write a new version of the software. It's my hostile software. And then every one of those client applications downloads and updates themselves with my software. Instant and botnet. It took you a, mil a millisecond to, to figure that out for yourself. This company actually took a while for, them, for us to really prove that, yes, this could happen this way. Are you sure it's bad? I mean, it's FTP. It's pretty safe. Um, <laughs> so, and so, you know, that, the results of that were kind of fun, but, you know, we, you know, using snippers is pretty basic and it's pretty common. Best quote ever out of that story is the, you know what the best thing to do to resolve this is? Let's just not tell anybody. <laughs> what are you, Apple? <laughs> Ooh, I hit an Apple joke. Somewhere Steve Jobs is plotting to take your money. So thank you very much. So, so the, the, the conclusion is, is that um, uh, pen testing today is pretty boring. It, it, I don't know how many people here have done pen tests or worked on pen tests, but they're pretty boring because the customer fundamentally doesn't want you to do exciting things. So one thing that Dave and I get to do is we get to find the customers that want us to actually stretch our wings a little bit and actually have fun with the pen test. So we actually enjoy pen tests quite a lot. So do we have any questions? Comments? Suggestions? We're going to be going to the... Does anybody here have an iPhone in a box that they recently found in a cab? <laughs> it's on eBay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for attending our boring talk.